if you're walking down the street dressed like this, no one's going to think you're fighting. Oh, no, but I have a little cut, maybe. They're going to be like, oh, she works at a coffee shop. Yeah. So, <laughs> this, is a, this is a Starbucks employee right the, now. This is no, not a no. fighter. <laughs> no, well, I, I broke my leg last year. And then I had a boot. Four different people, different days. They asked me, oh, so you broke your leg skating? Like ice skating? No. Some of them I say, yeah, sure, I did it. Also, like, now they're in LA. This, why are you who's <laughs> thinking about know. ice skating in LA? Ice skating for different people. Actually, I broke my leg the first time in my life. I broke it um, ice skating when I was like eight years old. <laughs> so I'm terrified. This is like a, this is like full circle. I right know. Now. <laughs> I'm terrified. I, I hate it. I don't like it. Nothing with skates. No, no, no. I don't like it. Hey, what's up, guys? She's not the champion right now but we're looking into the future exactly <laughs> this is gonna be we're, we're talking in the future now you're gonna see the episode when i'm already the champ so oh is that see you but you don't i don't know, know. when you are you know. when are you <laughs> don't worry about <laughs> I don't <that>. even <laughs> yeah but anyways for you guys who don't know this is uh sabina mazo she is uh an mma fighter former lfa strawweight flyweight flyweight oh my god you train with me Flyweight is flyweight is one twenty five pounds. Yeah, I train with you. I don't know. Where, where I weight. cannot make, I can make one twenty five, <laughs> but imagine one fifteen. I have That's to true. cut. That, you got to cut a leg off. Yeah. <laughs> LFA champion going for the LFA belt again. You were in the UFC previously. We're we're on the road back to getting into the UFC again. Yeah. Um, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate you. Well, thank you. So, for those who don't know, you are. Colombian. Very proud. Very proud. I think every single day I say that I'm Colombian. Every day. I think so. It's so weird. <laughs> it's so Why? weird. It comes up in the conversation. Like everyone. Because of your accent. My accent maybe, usually yeah. is my accent that yeah. it's always there. Like, oh, where, where are you from? People think I'm from Russia. Really? In the, all the time. You don't look like a Russian girl to me, though. But I don't I don't think I look too Colombian. Maybe that's I why. I also don't know what Colombian, like what, yeah. what's the Colombian look. People, when people think about Colombia, everyone is going to think about more like brownish, small people. Mm -hmm. But in my city where I come from, that is Medellin, there's a lot of, you know, people that look like me. A lot. Because the, the Spanish people went there and colonized and <clears throat> that's where a lot of people stayed. The, the Spanish people stayed. Oh, okay. But that's why there's a lot, a lot of white people there. Okay. Yeah. This makes sense. Tell me about your time growing up in Columbia. How was that for you? Because you spent pretty much your whole life until when? Yeah. There. All my life, actually. It was 18 years of my life okay. living there. Mm -hmm. And um, it's great. I mean, I wouldn't change it for anything. Okay. I wouldn't change it for anything because I grew up in kind of on a farm outside the city, mm -hmm. um, playing around. I went to school next to my house. So my childhood was very, like, kind of wild, you know. I grew up with 20 dogs. 20? 20 dogs. Okay. Because um, it was a big farm, you know. You don't, We don't have dog, dogs inside the house. It was everything outside. Mm -hmm. um, animals. I had, like, turtles, uh, chickens, everything. Everything. Would it was you, a farm. Would you say that you were, you're, because of that, you're an animal person? Ah, uh, yeah, for sure, for okay. sure. I'd be living with twenty dogs. You have to like them or, <laughs> or not. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, um, I spent all my childhood with with animals. It was a little bit hard to see my friends from school because they live very far away. Okay. So I spent almost all the time there, playing outside, um, not growing up with an iPad or technology. I mean, yes, there was. TV and stuff for sure. Mm -hmm. But um, it was more by my own, on, honestly. My sister is five years older, so we didn't really, you know, play that much. Mm -hmm. We were in a different stage of life every time. So, yeah. yeah. And you're 26. I'm 26 now. 26, yeah. Yeah. You came here to the United States when you were 18. Yeah. And now that you're 26, you've had some time to live here. What would you say was difficult about your transition moving to America? Oh, well, you know, it was not that hard to take the decision because to make the decision because when I moved, I was already fighting. Mm -hmm. I had two pro fights. I didn't do amateur fights. There was not amateur fights in Colombia. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was very easy to like, I have to move on. 
you know, the city was very small for me. Like mm -hmm. Colombia started to be very small. I try to fight and like compete and learn the most that I could, but it was, that was it, mm -hmm. you know. And in that moment, when I turned 18, I finished school and I had to make a decision if I was going to continue in the sport or I was going to study in the university over there or what I was going to do with my life. But I had to make a decision. Right. So it was kind of easy, you know. Also, what helped was that um, when I was very young, when I was like from one year old to four years old, I lived in Miami. Okay. So that helped too, like in the transition, because I have that a little bit of that American culture into me. Mm -hmm. um, me and my family, we decided to move. Well, they decided to move because in that time, 1998, 1999, mm -hmm. um, it was very like insecure. There was a lot of people uh, that were being kidnapped and oh, wow. stolen, and like they, you know, a lot, a lot of robbery, a lot of stuff. And where we lived, that was outside, um, it was dangerous. Like, you you couldn't go outside the city after, like, 5 p.m. 5? 5. 5 p.m. <laughs> because it, it gets dark at 5. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, or you stay in the city or, or that's it, you know? Wow. So, things like that were not very safe. My family took this. We were like, no, we're going we're gonna to leave uh, the country for a little bit. We went straight to Miami, and I love it. I love it over there. I start speaking Spanish and English at the same time. You know, oh, my Spanish okay. was kind yeah. of uh, with the Cubans and, uh, and you know, they mix all the languages. They of start course. speaking English and Spanish. So that was kind of my base when I started, um, you know, even school and preschool. And when I be went back to Colombia was a little bit weird because my friends didn't understand you know because they don't speak imagine uh, a four-year-old five-year-old speaking in english and spanish like no but did you keep it did you keep the english that you learned mm. because you weren't practicing it? not right? that much yeah. exactly i mean i didn't lost it all but i never practiced you right know? i i mean i listened to music and i traveled back to united states a couple of times mm -hmm. But it's not the same. If you don't practice, yeah. you don't have it. So. It's not the same. Definitely no. not. No. But it was not, going back to your question, no. It was not very hard, the transition. I think um, what it was like the hardest was more my family. They they were, of course, in Colombia and I missed them and everything. But every time I fought, they came to visit me and that made it a little bit easier, you know, for that. But the rest, you know. I don't know. When you have a goal, it's it's easy to do stuff. I feel like when people have have to move outside their uh, homes or their country uh, because they're forced, that's different. Yeah. You know, that's like that must be very hard and brave to do it because for me, it was just to have a goal and it doesn't matter the price or where I live. Mm -hmm. I have to get it. So before that, you told me that you had already had two pro fights before you even moved to the United States, right? Where did that come from? Where did where where did that spark that interest in martial arts spark for you? Because if you're already 18 and you had two pro fights, it had to have been when you were younger. So you know, yeah. talk to me about how that how that happened. It's very weird. I still don't know. Really? <laughs> I really okay. don't. I mean, I kind of do, but um, none of my family really practice any sport. Mm -hmm. They're into business. Uh, there's no athletes. There's no. No one trying to eat clean in the family. Um, so it, it, it was a little bit weird, but um, I always tried different sports mm -hmm. when I was growing up. I tried from climbing to soccer to tennis to volleyball to every single thing I tried mm -hmm. because I was very active and I liked that adrenaline. I think that was the things that I liked the most. Mm -hmm. So from all the sports that I tried, I loved to climb and... Um, Silks, I don't know. Yeah, that's so, the correct name. You know the thing that they do in the circus and they have like a, a long... Oh, and they're silk, like kind of hanging in the... And they the, hang in uh -huh. that thing. That's that I did for a while too. Well, do you consider that acrobatics? Uh, kind of, okay. yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And I like that because of the adrenaline because you have to climb very, very high and mm -hmm. then make some drops. And I noticed... Those kind of things were the the ones that I liked, the ones that were like dangerous and and gave me that adrenaline rush. 
until like I did boxing, a boxing class. And that was it. I was like, oh, I have to, I have to go back to the gym. I want to do this. I didn't have any idea of what it was. If it was boxing, MMA, jiu-jitsu. For me, it was everything the same, mm -hmm. you know. So I tried boxing. Then I did a uh, jiu-jitsu class. They submitted me, like, I don't know how many times. Uh, the first week, my rib got, like, uh, it first didn't broke. Week. The first week, my rib got, like, into the other one. I don't know how like that separated. happened. Yeah. yeah, it didn't broke. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is it. This is what I like. I have to keep going with this. And, and I stuck with jujitsu for uh, two years, only doing jujitsu and a little bit of boxing. Wow. So I still and don't understand why or what, what, what it was. And how old were you at that time? I was uh, 15, almost 16 years old. Wow. So prior to you fighting, how much, like prior to your first fight, how much training time did you have? So, for my MMA match, you mean? Was that your first fight? Your first fight was MMA? No, no. no. My first fight was jiu-jitsu. I competed two months okay. uh, with jiu-jitsu training. But you see, now some people are going to say that jiu-jitsu is not a fight. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, but it is. It is. I mean, it's a good start. Yeah. It's a yeah. good start. I'm not saying it's a fool, but it is a fight. Yeah. And you got the adrenaline. And mm -hmm. you're going in there. And, yes, you can tap and... It's kind of safer. Yeah. But it is a fight. Yeah. I competed jujitsu for uh, the first year that I started training. Okay. Two months in was my first competition. Um, and then I competed boxing. I went. Okay. I'm a box. Well, in that time I was boxing uh, state champion. Nice. So those were like the two things that I started competing and I loved it. And actually my, my dad and my mom didn't really thought I was serious about it. They were like, yeah, whatever. It's a hobby. You can continue doing it. But I was very serious with it. You know, I started training all the time. I finished school and went straight to uh, the gym. Like I had to get a bus, go all the way to the gym and stay there from like 4 p.m. to like 9 p.m. or something like that. Yeah. And um, my parents um, started seeing like I was competing, but like they never went to a competition or anything and then my dad um my dad loves um electronic music okay and he's like come with me to a party and everything i'm like yeah yeah sure but i have a competition tomorrow and he's like yeah yeah whatever you you can leave <laughs> wh wh whatever time you want and then you go i'm like okay i went there to the party with my dad um he stayed in the party for sure and then i was like what it was like I think 2.30, 3 a.m. I went home. A.m. A.m. Oh, no. Well, yeah. Parties in Colombia, they, they last until at least 6 a.m. At least. At least. At least. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. 3 a.m. 3 a.m. Go, got, uh, I went home, uh, took a shower. I ate and I went to do my first boxing competition. And you didn't sleep? No, I didn't sleep at all. <laughs> I didn't sleep at all. I mean, I didn't drink also, but I, I went to party the day right. before my first competition. The girl that I fought was like, I was a kid. I was 16 years old and she was like 32 and like wow. huge, okay. like three times my size. Um, but I loved it. I, that was like the best fight ever. I still have pictures of that day. And um, yeah, I mean, that was like, I have to, I have to really train and sleep a little bit, but I won that match. Um, you won that fight with no sleep. I won that, yeah, Again, exactly. At sixteen against the thirty something. Sixteen, year old. thirty-two years old. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that was. Uh, That's a good start. Yeah. That's a good start. Yeah, 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 for sure. Boxing was like that uh, kind of entrance of competing, and you know having that uh, real punches and and weight cuts, and that's the first like moment I I passed through that. So yeah. If you weren't doing this. If you weren't fighting in any combat sport, no combat sports existed, what do you think you'd be doing? Um, so I love biology, actually. Okay. And when I finished uh, finished school, I was between going to medical school or fighting. Super what, what different. What were you going to do in medical school? Were you going to be like... Uh, uh, I wanted to be a surgeon. A surgeon? Yeah. What kind of surgeon? 
Uh, I like everything like with the brain and and stuff like that. So you want to be doing brain surgery? Yes, I okay. I used to love. <laughs> really, I loved it. I love biology. Um, I was all into it, but uh, I don't know because of life. I had my first uh, MMA fight months before I finished school, like three months before I finished uh, school. High school. High school. Right. And then um, as soon as I finished that fight, I knew I was going to fight forever. So, so it was that. It was that, yeah, that fight. That, that fight was like the one that like, no, no, you, this is for you. Okay. Like you're not going to study medicine. <laughs> no medical school for you. Uh, because it's, you know, I knew that medical school or anything was going to take me a lot of time, you know, and my energy. And mm -hmm. I wanted to really focus in fighting. Um, if I was going to go to medical school, I really was going to focus on that, you know. So, yeah, besides fighting, I think I like that. And I, well, I studied nutrition as soon as I came here. It's kind of into the biology and things like that. Yeah. But, I mean, it's not the same. I would have never guessed no. a surgeon. Yeah. I thought maybe like a veterinarian or something because you yeah. talked about the, the Dogs, animals. But, yeah. Wow. Since I was little. I knew I liked uh, anything with surgery, blood. I always like to see things like that when they... You like the blood, This huh? is weird, but in, in <laughs> December in Colombia, they kill the pig and like everyone in the street. And I used to like to see that. I mean, it's very, very weird. Not the, the animals suffering, but it was not bad for me to see the blood and how they cut and how they clean and all these things. Wow. And I was like being there and watching it and I like it, you know, and so I don't have anything like against blood, so. I don't have anything against blood <laughs> either, but you know something that I've seen, I don't think very many people know this. So I was in the police academy in San Diego, right? And um, there is, obviously when you're in the police academy, you have to go through like uh, different things in order to become a cop, right? And one of those things is you have to watch an autopsy but you have to watch it there live like it's right in front of you you can reach your hand like that close you can reach Ooh. out and touch it right that was one of the I, to this day <laughs> that is one of the craziest experiences i've ever had wow first of all walking into what is is it a morgue yeah right? i think so yeah. yeah yeah but i guess it's for the for the city yeah. or whoever right and i remember what the smell until I've never smelled anything like that in my life. To this day, still never smelled anything like that in my life. But watching them cut through this body and yeah. just like take out, and they're like, the Pieces. dude's like, oh, here's the liver, and just puts it on the table. <laughs> to you. Oh, here's the the heart. heart. Here's this. Oh, I can tell you exactly how they died. Look at the plaque buildup and their arteries. And it just and then people in my class are like, oh, I want to touch that. And then the guy's like, oh, feel free. Put the gloves. So people get I'll gloves. I'll be and one of them. Uh, yeah. Of course. Of course you would. Do you? No. No I'm way? Not, hell no. I'm not, Why not? No. No I'm way? I'm good. I don't, I'm cool with seeing it. I don't want to touch it. I don't want to touch it. No, but you're not curious like how how mm -mm. it is, how nope. it feels. No. Nope. Nothing? Nope. Mm -mm. Yeah. No, I can see. I can see how it moves. I, I, I can guess. Well, at least you can see. A lot of people can like yeah. really cannot see anything of blood or cutting. That, But that's. But I'll I tell you this, tough one. The, one of the craziest parts of it all, there's two crazy parts. I'm sorry if this is grossing anybody out. I apologize in advance. <laughs> I know. Um, so after he, first of all, three things. I said two, three. Number one, before he even got to the organs, when he broke the ribs back, <gasps> that was, ah. Oh, yeah. Oh. That, that, <laughs> you felt that <laughs> I one. I felt that one. Oh, yeah. Because he had like these, this like, he's like, oh, my oh God. So that was bad. Right? That yeah. was bad. Then after all the organs and everything came out, there's blood pooling at the bottom, like the back part of your, like where your spine and all that stuff is. He has a ladle. And he's dipping the ladle into the body and draining the blood oh my from God. the ladle. That was oh my crazy. God. That's insane. Yeah, that's insane. Then the last thing that was crazy that's was insane. when he took the brain out. He had a saw. Oh so God. first he, he cut a line. Peeled the skin back on this woman's head. It's an old lady yeah. that he's doing this on. Yeah. Pulled the skin back on this lady's head. Takes the and we're all standing there. And then he brings like this thing, so it can cover because there's gonna be 
stuff flying everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Blood and things. So it like protects us from getting splashed on. <laughs> but it's clear so we can see. And he's like just going through around the head. And then like takes it off and then takes out the brain and he's like slicing into it and he's like look like you can see dude that's crazy insane that is to crazy. this day like anybody i don't know if they allow people to do this like go watch I it i don't know i don't think so if you can go like i, I would like to see that it's interesting yeah one of the craziest but things ever. And you the wanted, smell, and you the smell to, must be very bad, honestly. Disgusting. Yeah, the smell must be very like the, I don't think that there's I to this day, that that was 10 years ago. To this day, I still can't describe whoa, whoa, it yeah. just it just smells like death. Yeah. Oh. Just smells like death. Yeah, no, no. That's the that's too much. Oh, that's too much. You yeah. can watch a pig getting Yeah, because <laughs> I mean, yeah, and you're preparing it, you're gonna eat it, and it's different. Okay. And you just killed, so it doesn't smell that bad. That's fair. That's yeah. fair. This the, body was there for a couple the days. Smell. Yeah. I mean, or I think it's not a human. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, this is last thing, and then we're gonna get into. These I questions. don't. I don't think vegans and vegetarians like me anymore. No, probably. Not. <laughs> I'm probably sorry. Not. <laughs> <laughs> you know something really funny? There's a lady on my street. I live in Venice. She has a pig, and she walks. The a pig big one. It's fat, dude. Oh my god, a real it's a pig. Fat, big, fat, like a hog. Okay. And she has it on a leash. Oh my god. And she's walking it down the street. My dog, Brooklyn, sees this and she's like, What the fuck is that? Like, she's so confused. She doesn't bark at it or nothing. She's just like, ah, what? what is that? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? I don't know what that I, is. I feel the same. Like I see those things in the city. Imagine Benny's beach. You see a pig. No, no, no. That I mean, not for me. I wouldn't have a a pig. We had a home, uh, we used to have turtles. But it was a farm, you know, like there's places to have things, you know. I don't yeah. know if I'll have that in L.A. No. Um, so for those who don't know, you train at Black House. We both train at Black House here in L.A. There is a nice group of girls there training together. From my knowledge, you and Pietro were the first two that I saw at mm -hmm. the gym. And now, you know, Jacqueline is pretty much training at Black House full time. Yeah. Tabitha comes down and trains sometimes. Mackenzie Dern has been to the gym. Yeah. How do you, as a as a woman, create that environment where other women feel safe enough to come when, you know, it's a male dominated sport. Yeah. There's mostly men in the gym. So how do you create that that environment for other women to feel safe and want to come? You know, um, I know before I went to Black House, there was a little group as well. Before um, in the other Black House, there was Piera, uh, Tabata was there as well. There's a little bit of girls, you know, that is very rare to see in MMA gyms. But I feel um, with Jackie, with Piera, with me, um, Tabata, we help each other. We really care about each other, you know, for their fight camps or outside the fight camps. It becomes a friendship. And I feel that um, it's easy to tell, you know, and other girls can see that and they like that because it's not only like you go there and, okay, whatever, you do your training and then you leave, uh, which, yeah, we go there and do that. But um, in this particular case, I feel it is a friendship. You know, for me, it was very personal, Jackie's fight. She fought in April mm -hmm. for the LFA belt, 135 pounds. And it was like I fought. You know, I was exhausted. Like, for me, I finished the fight and I started, like, I was more tired than, than Jackie. Really, I couldn't move. I was exhausted because it's personal. Yeah. And I feel a lot of people um, don't, don't create that connection. Um, and you don't need to do it with everyone for sure. Not, yes. you know, because it has also to be something with everyone. I so cannot be, be the, mutual. exactly. Yeah. It has to be mutual. So, um, it is exactly the same thing when they fight. It's personal. Mm -hmm. I train with them and I do the whole fight camp. Um, I really try to do my best version of who they're fighting. Uh, I try to simulate, I try to study. Mm -hmm. So. I feel um, I we we all do that with each other. Jackie came to help me for my fight camp. Mm -hmm. uh, Piet is helping me, and Tawata she knows that she has us. So 
I feel showing this kind of things and 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 giving that um, kind of sisterhood helps to create that uh, safe environment for women because it's you know I've been in other gyms too and um, you just train with the guys you know it's not bad it's good there's a lot of advantages from it you know but um, it will never be the same to do a sparring session with someone you know your same uh, gender it's not the same yeah there's the competition a spark in there mm. um, and I feel it's very necessary because when you um, train with guys or in my experience when I train with guys or they're very technical uh, there's others that go super super aggressive and use the whole you know strength so they can dominate you completely uh, so it's never going to be the same it's never it's never the same mm -hmm. uh, but with us and I guess it's the same thing with guys when you start uh, training with someone similar size or weight class mm -hmm you have uh, that kind of competition. Oh, this point I can do this. And then the next one, they fuck you up, you know? So that's the way you improve. Mm -hmm. It's not the bad competition part of it. It's the, you know, the good one where each one grows. So um, it's been like that for all this year, kind of when Jackie came, um, we're very similar size. So yeah, it's, it's, it's been perfect. Yeah. That's good. I'm glad. I've I'm able to see this myself and I like it. I like it a lot. I like it for you guys because I think I've trained a lot of different gyms and you don't really see that too often, especially in MMA gyms. In jiu-jitsu gyms, it's very different. There's always usually like a group of girls that are always training together, you know, and, and they can they can easily find other girls to train with. But I feel like when it comes to Muay Thai or when it comes to MMA- It's very selfish. I don't I wouldn't even say that it's selfish, although it does it does feel that way. But in a way, there there isn't that same bond. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like I started, as stupid as this sounds, like every gym that I've been to, except for for Black House, has been a jujitsu based gym. Okay. So even when like when I first started training at Lloyd Irvin's in, in Maryland, then I moved from that gym, started training at another gym in DC. Jiu Jitsu based gym. Then I moved to San Diego. I'm training at Alliance, Alliance yeah. Jiu, -Jitsu, Jiu Jitsu based gym. So it's like everywhere I go, and I always had that like camaraderie. Oh, like let's, people are hanging out after the gym. You know, we're going to the beach, we're going over here, we're going there. Like there's a lot of that, you know, family, yeah. friend kind of dynamic, right? Yeah, yeah. But then with the MMA gyms, I feel like it's not, yeah. not like that at all. It's not, it's not coming. And I feel it's also not only men and women because in my experience before, when I used to uh, train at Kings, mm -hmm. Benil Darush was one person that had that with me. Mm. You know, he was kind of a big brother. And literally for weight cuts, he was there. Mm -hmm. He cut way with me if it was, if I needed to. Um, you know, extra trainings, he was there 24-7. So I think it's the connection that you build with someone, right. you know. But for sure... And between women, you don't see it that often because they think they're going to fight each other, maybe. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they already have their own plan. Mm -hmm. So they don't let that connection to happen. But as soon as it happens, it's just beautiful. It's perfect, you know. Like, I know, like, the past weeks, I'm going to fight in two weeks now. Mm -hmm. And the past weeks, I'm not a human being you know there's things that i'm super tired and i cannot do so they are there for me yeah you know they help me do my rest of my life and you know that's very um you know nice to have so it's it becomes like a family like you said it's very yeah. friendly very familiar so yeah i guess how is it slash how has it been um training as a woman in a male dominated sport do you feel like it's it's weird sometimes? Do you feel like you are always welcomed, whether it's at the gyms, whether it's at events, anything like that? Do you always feel supported or sometimes do you feel like there's barriers? You know, um, it depends. But I think we have to start off by you have to um, earn your spot. Mm. Being a male or female, whatever, you have to earn your spot. Um, you cannot pretend when you get to a gym that, you know, everyone is going to treat you not about nice, but like 
that friendly or that close. I mm. feel you have to build that relationship with everyone, with the coaches, with the other teammates. Um, so starting from there, you know, it doesn't matter who you are. You really have to earn that spot, own your respect by training, by showing up, by helping each other. Um, but yes, I I felt, you know, that barrier, especially at the beginning in some jujitsu gyms I went before. Um, I was very young and um, it never happened. Nothing really bad, but you saw the intentions that of some men were not pure for training, you know, more sexual. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. More sexual. So, yes, as a woman, you have to face that. Yeah. And I think still it happens. You of know, course. I'm talking about this like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, but I know still it can happen. And if as a woman, you don't know, have the posture to like stop things, you know, it can get to worse. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yes, it, it is. It, it can happen. I heard stories so that's a hard part, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, there's young people, young girls starting and they don't have the enough maturity to handle this kind of situation. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it, it, that, that is a really hard part of the of being a woman in the sport and a young woman in the sport. Because, sure. I mean, if you're old enough, I mean, it's easier to manage the situation. Yeah, yeah. Which I, I did and nothing really happened, but I faced that problem a couple of times. Of course. Yeah. So that, especially in jiu-jitsu, I don't know why jiu-jitsu gyms, um, I passed through those kind of things. It's yeah. very, huh. trust me when I know, uh, when I tell you, I know how, yeah. how the jiu-jitsu community is just full of that. It is full. Yeah. But something I, that, you, that you mentioned that I want people to understand, because a lot of people that, start training they they don't understand that piece not about the discernment from from women but the you have to kind of earn your spot oh yeah and i think a lot of people come into the gym and they think that it's going to be like oh what's up and everybody's going to be like exactly you know buddy buddy with you but like they don't know you yeah and these people that they're on the mats with they've bled they've sweat with these people they've been to competitions with these people they've they've sat on the side of the mat while this person won a world title or won whatever, you know? So it's like you go, you come into this gym as someone, they have no idea who exactly, you are. Exactly. And you're just starting to, like, I don't want to say it like this, but, like, if you're a white belt coming into a gym with a bunch of purple, brown, and black belts, to them, you don't have any value yet because they're like, oh, well, yeah, I can help this person grow mm -hmm. to have value as a blue belt and get their technique to up to par to where they're, Competing with us. Yeah. But until that happens, like you said, you have to earn. You have to. You got to earn your People stripes. want every, everything easy. Yeah. You know, everyone wants to have everything like like uh, if they deserve it. And no one deserves nothing. Nothing. It doesn't matter. Again, it doesn't matter if it's a woman or a man. Mm -hmm. you, you have to fight for your thing. It's the same thing as fighting. Yep. You're not going to be the best in the world. You got to fight for it. Yep. Every single fight counts. And that's how I feel you can earn the respect from, from everyone. From the fighting community from your gym from your manager from the promotion you fight um which also it's like sometimes a lot of people um talk shit about ufc that ah they just give value to some fighters but what what are those fighters doing you know they're, they're given a show exactly. they're they're giving knockouts mm -hmm. to people people likes to see that yes there's other trash talking that whatever <laughs> but it's i mean you got to earn your spot or your respect or your, a bigger paycheck. You got to fight for it. It's not It's not going to be easy. It's not like, ah, oh, yes, you fight and whatever. Uh, now you're going to be the best in the world. No way. No, you don't deserve it yet. I, and I'm 100% with you on the no one deserves anything because I think a lot of people get onto this train and the people love to say, I deserve. You deserve what you get and what you work for. And if you work half-assed for something... You're going to get what exactly. half ass work, <laughs> what that gets. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And also it's hard to, I mean, you can work a lot and I feel sometimes it's not only about work. I don't know if it's luck or destiny or however you want to call it, but sometimes it's about that too. You know, I started very young and I never thought I was going to be in the UFC that young. Mm. I got to the UFC. I signed when I was 20 years old. Mm -hmm. But did my first fight when I was 21. Mm -hmm. And I really never thought 
about I wanted to be in the UFC, but I never thought it was going to be that fast. Right. You know, and yeah. and I did my I got the LFA belt, defend the belt, and they called me from the UFC. Of course, I wanted to go and I went, but I was like, wait, what now? Like, this is just starting. Like, how is this possible? Like, yes, I had six fights already. Yeah. But for me, it was very fast, you know? So it's a lot of factors that it's not only the hard work that, yes, I do it every single day. But I, like me, there's tons of other fighters, mm -hmm. you know? So it's that plus opportunities or uh, the people, you know, the connections. There's a lot of things involved. So it's not really, it's not about deserving. It's about a lot, a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> I th personally think that it's about alignment. Like, are you aligning everything in your life? Everything in your life has to be aligned, not necessarily aligned with fighting, but aligned with whatever that is, right? Mm -hmm. Because I can tell you from personal experience, when I'm in a shitty relationship and there's a lot of stupid stuff happening around me, I can't really focus on the fight. Definitely. Because I'm thinking about all these other things that are distracting yeah. me from the actual fight versus not dating anyone or dating someone that's good for you, you go into these situations a little bit different. Your energy is different because you're not sad. You're not anxious. You're not thinking. So you're fully focused on what you should be focused. And not. And everyone yeah. is the same, not only fighting. Mm -hmm. I guess it's only, it's work or. It's everything. It's everything. Mm -hmm. It's everything. And I, that's why yeah. I say alignment. Yeah. yeah. I, I think, I think it's like that. Like mm -hmm. the, the moments that I did the worst in my MMA career or in my life. It was exactly that. I was not aligned. Uh, bad relationships. Uh, the people around me were not the ideal, mm -hmm. let's say. And uh, But also, you got to pass through that. Yeah. You have you to. Got, if not, you're <laughs> never going to learn as well how mm -hmm. to get out of bad uh, relationships or from situations. So that also kind of... Uh, kind of... It's rough, but you have to pass through that. That's gonna define you as a as a person and as a fighter in the longer way. So, absolutely, yeah. What would you say is one of the toughest things being a professional athlete, a professional fighter, that not a lot of women outside of the sport and men in general, because I'm sure there's a lot of men in the sport that don't know what goes on with female athletes. What are some of the tough, tougher things that you think we wouldn't know about? Well, let's start with hormones, I hormones. guess. Okay. <laughs> Tell me more. That's one of the hardest, um, actually, because we work different. Women work, we work different than men. Of course. Very different. Um, and depending on, for example, menstrual cycle. Yeah. And the weight cut. Yeah. That's number one. I feel that men, maybe men know already how it is, but you guys don't need to pass through that. So yeah. don't really understand how it works. To the to the degree that it is. Because I yeah. know a lot of guys can understand it because they know that you are you're have you have a period and also that you're going to fight. Yeah. But they may not understand what all goes into that. Or the consequences. Dating, yeah. Or maybe dating. dating a fighter, yeah. yeah. And I'm not talking about the, 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 the kind of the mood or whatever. Because mm -hmm. that I feel personally like you can suck it up and just work. That's how I do it. Yeah. Um, but it's more about how uh, your body retains the water. Mm. How um, you're not losing weight for weeks. Mm. And it's because of your period. Right. Those kind of things, are, I feel, are the hardest uh, to be like a woman in MMA. Mm -hmm. When I, um, one of my fights in the UFC, it was very weird, but um, I was not planning to have my period at all. Okay. At all. And, uh, but I was, it was hard to make weight. And I was making 135. I fight 125. Mm -hmm. And it was very hard. And I was not understanding what was going on. But if that was like stress, maybe, or whatever. And, uh, but whatever I make weight, I was going to the, um, the official weightings, um, in the UFC. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, no, I'm packing everything. I start packing. I put some extra clothes. Up. I don't even know why I put extra clothes, but I put extra clothes. Up. When I got to the weightings, um, I was the first one. I was the first one. So I, nice. It's going to be my first time checking out the first fighter. That's amazing. I was like, oh, I have to go to the restroom. 
I went there. I got my period. I couldn't go out. I was like in my underwear. I had an accident. You right, know, I right. couldn't. I, I was like, so now what? <laughs> I don't know why I put that extra clothes in the, there. The universe. And right they there. saved me. Uh, the UFC staff saved me and everything. But this kind of thing. Imagine if I didn't went to the restroom mm -hmm. and then I go there and Ooh. just that would be fucking bad. And I, I mean, and I feel like this kind of things people have to know it because it happens and women out there. It happens. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, this boxer. I don't remember her name, but she was like, uh, "Yeah, uh, I got my fucking period the fight, the day of the fight, and she won the world uh, title." And the first thing she said after she won was like, "You know what? Today I got my period, and here I am winning world ch uh, a world champion, you know, belt." So it is. You got to deal with it. Yeah, suck it up and and work. And do it, you know, it doesn't really matter. But men don't understand these kind of things. Yeah. You know, like uh, more like the consequences with how your body works, mm -hmm. how the weight cut is influenced. Uh, so that's one of the hard things. And for sure, how men, not that much anymore, but when I first started training, how they um, kind of take a value of you because you're a woman so they don't even like train with you or oh, I see, I see. don't give you the respect in the mat mm -hmm. uh as you deserve you know that is also like something that um i stopped like caring because i feel it speaks more about them than about me yes because a lot of, a lot of men like they don't or they don't shake the hands with you or they don't want to train with you mm -hmm. Uh, because they feel you're not going to be a good training um, mm -hmm. session for them. And that still happens. But again, I don't get mad at it anymore just because I don't really need to train with that person. And whatever, I feel it's uh, that person is kind of limited in, in their own mind. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. You mentioned mm -hmm. no one in your family was an athlete. Do you consider yourself an athlete? I do consider myself an athlete. Did you always consider No. Yourself? Okay. No, no, no way. No way. I was like, I always wanted to be an athlete when I was growing up okay. because of all the sports. But as soon as I started like living 24-7 towards a goal, like a sports goal, mm -hmm. that's when I, I knew I was an athlete. The way I was eating, uh, managing my sleep, you know, investing everything for a performance, that's when I was like, yeah, I'm an athlete. But not at the beginning, for sure not. Athlete, you gotta, Very you gotta really work hard for it. It's yeah. not, it's not like, oh, I train every single day. Not even like that, you know? So yeah, I do consider myself um, an athlete. And it was a little weird because at the beginning when I started training, as soon as I started, I start changing my my lifestyle. I stop uh, going out with my friends, like to drink. Um, I start kind of taking care of what I was eating without even having knowledge. But mm -hmm. you know, it was like a natural transition to me. Um, but but yeah, with the years of experience and being in the UFC and a lot of nutritionists and other things, that's when I really thought like, okay, I'm an athlete now. The reason I ask you that is because for a long time, I did not no. think of myself as an athlete. No. But. Why not? For me, when I always thought about athletes, I thought about people that did like ball sports, like play basketball, you play baseball, you play football, you play soccer, you do a track, like you do any of these kinds of things. I always thought like, oh, those people are athletes. Okay. But because, I don't know. I don't know. I just felt. That was what an yeah. athlete was. And training martial arts to me was not like being an athlete. Being, athlete. being an athlete, you know? But then I think as time went on, and I also think that I didn't think that I was an athlete because I wasn't doing certain things. Like I didn't, I never touched a weight until I moved to California when I was 23. Oh. Never lifted weights. So the entire time from nine until 23, all I did was train. I never lifted. I never 
cared about my diet. Like I would literally eat pizza before stepping on the mat. Like <laughs> <laughs> it was it was bad. It yeah. was bad. But not like I wasn't eating like that all the time. No, right? no, like, but I get it. My mom doesn't make that kind of food. She doesn't buy that kind of food. But like I come from work and I'm like, oh, I gotta. I got to go to the gym. I need to go eat something. There's a 7-Eleven right around the corner. Yeah. Let me get that 7-Eleven pizza yeah. and a Gatorade. Wow. <laughs> and I'm stepping on the mats. Wow. So I think that might have been why I didn't think of myself as an athlete. But then as time went on and I started to fix different things, like started lifting weights, started changing my diet, uh, focusing on sleep and, and, you know, doing all these different things. I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, okay. Like now I see I it now. Yeah. Because – of all the sacrifices now that I have to make and how difficult it's become. Yeah. Because when you just think about like, oh, I just want to train, that's not hard. Like, that's not hard. Yeah. No. Anyone can go. Anyone I mean, not, can. And I don't want to say like, it's not hard to train. It's difficult. Yeah. Right. But what's more difficult is the rest of the discipline that comes along with, oh, maybe I don't feel like training today, but guess what? I'm still going to go anyway. Or, you know, I'm tired yeah. today. So what? doesn't matter how I feel. I still have to go. Exactly. Especially if you got to fight. Yeah. You definitely got to go. Yeah. You wake up in the morning at 6 a.m. Like, oh, I got to go lift. Like, I don't want to go, but I have to. Yeah. And I think that. that Taking responsibility. When, as soon as you take responsibility of the the sport that you, you practice, mm-hmm. I feel that it's serious, you know. Even if it's rest, if it's uh, training, nutrition, whatever. Yeah. But if you're really investing into it, not only as a hobby. Well, yeah, I think that's kind of an athlete. But I'm curious. So, what, what do you, what foods do your mom make? You were mentioning that your mom oh, didn't cook I mean, those kind of things. Well, how you grew like, up eating what? So my mom's from Grenada. Yeah, she's Caribbean. So like I don't know, rice and peas, oxtail, salt fish, uh, provisions, yams, all these kind of things. And still, you eat like that or not really? Well, I don't make that kind of food. I, now I, I mean, I still eat healthy, but I make like. But not not salmon yeah. and Brussels so you didn't sprouts keep, and stuff like keep that. that culture part of it into you. Just because I don't know how to cook it. Okay, but that's part of the reason. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. To you, that's part of the reason why I moved to LA because they got really good Caribbean food here. Okay, so they do yes, San Diego garbage. Okay, but LA good. really good. Okay. Yeah, so I don't know how to cook Caribbean food yet. Okay, but I need to learn. My mom, my mom needs to teach me. Yeah, yeah. You gotta have the, those recipes. Curry goat. You ever had curry goat before? No, never. Sabina. I never had that. That sounds so good. What is that? Uh, so you've had curry things before. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's goat, and they curry it. <gasps> wow. And then they usually do like uh, rice and peas with it. Give you some like collard greens or something like that. Okay. Yeah, it's that, good. That sounds good. That sounds good. We're gonna go. I didn't knew. They had curry that much in the Caribbean. Everything is curry. What? It's a lot. So think about what the Caribbean is. They call the Caribbean the West Indies. Okay. West yeah. In, like yeah, 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 yeah. You're yeah. right. You're right. So you're a lot right. of the spices that from India, when they were colonizing everything, they brought it to the Caribbean. Okay. Like Grenada, for example, is is called the island the island of spice. Wow. Because they have a lot of spices there. Yeah. A when lot was the last time you went there? Uh, last year, May. Um, very recent. Yeah, I need to go. I was supposed to go this summer, but it just didn't work out. My mom is like back and forth. She has a house there. Yeah. You like it there? I love it. Yeah. The the moment that I start making money. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast I'm, better work soon. <laughs> very soon. <laughs> no, I, I give myself maybe like eight to ten years and then. I'm just go gonna there. Go. Yeah, I'm just gonna go. That's and nice. Chill. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like America's cool and it's fun, but I'm not the biggest fan of the the rat race. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. It just feels like every day is like this, and it's, I've been doing this pretty much my whole life. Yeah. I'm tired, man. Yeah. I'm tired. I agree with you. I love America. But I don't think I will retire here or live the rest of my life just because of that. I yeah. feel it's too much. Yeah, it's way too much. A lot of competition or new cars, new this, get this, get this, mm-hmm. and it's a different rhythm. And I need to calm down. So, but I don't know where I will go. You know what's really interesting about that? I didn't realize that until I went back to Grenada last year. 
Yeah. Because I'm wired like an American. And so I'm like, oh, we got to be fucking... Let's work. Let's go. Like, yeah. we got to, we got shit to do. We got blah, blah, blah. And then I get over there and everybody's just like chilling. Like, <laughs> like what's up? I'm like... Want a like, beer oh, and sleep? Y'all, y'all could be making so much money. Y'all could be doing this. Y'all could be doing that. And they're just like, bro, shut up. Sit down. Have a fucking Coke and yeah, relax. Yeah. Like, it's not that deep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I think I realized pretty quickly like I think there is a balance right like there should still be a balance of like you can't always just be not no. lazy and not doing anything no, no. but you also can't be balls to the wall trying to make money trying to do all this stuff yeah all the time because no, it's haven't. not good for you no. so but I think a good balance of that you know is, is good yeah 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 so uh, I have to go there it must be nice go with this so I think we both have have dated other people in the fight world and I know as a as a man it's not imperative that I date somebody that fights in fact I would tell you that I don't ever want to date a fighter again just because of what I've gone through and for, <laughs> for those reasons I will probably stay away from it <laughs> but as a woman how is it for you dating number one and then number two do you feel like you're whoever you're partner is has to also be a fighter or train in some capacity uh, that's a tough one but you know in my experience it, it doesn't really matter if it's fighter or not fighter it can be a douchebag you know okay. i mean i started from there because in my past i had bad experiences um and good but it's more like the person itself but it is more common to find crazy people in the fight industry. Yes. You got to be a little crazy in this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not uh, for a normal person to spend all their time and their effort to train to go to a fight. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not an easy lifestyle either. So um, I feel like, yeah, it depends on the person more than like the sport that it, they practice. Mm -hmm. But um, it's also hard to date people outside the industry because that's what you do 24 7. i mean you're surrounded by or fighters or people from the industry mm -hmm. you know everything with the fighting so it's easier to find someone and to have more things in common as well also someone that is going to understand your lifestyle mm -hmm. because maybe not a fighter but an athlete because this is your two or three times a day life. Mm -hmm. You go to train in the morning, in the evening, at night. And when you go home, you're tired. So it is kind of a different style of someone that, you know, works in a office job. So it has it the, the advantages, but at the same time, it really depends. You you can get lucky or not. It's a, it's a trick. Yeah. That's, that's very true. I've, I've spoken to one of my friends about this. I'm curious to see what you think about it. but And I, I want to preface this by saying that you, Piera, and Jackie do not behave this way. <laughs> so I just want to start with that. Okay. You ladies don't behave that way. But what I've found, especially when it comes to like Muay Thai and MMA gyms, Jiu-Jitsu not as much, but Muay Thai and MMA gyms, the women become more masculine because... They have to, in a way, compete with the men in the gym, but they don't turn it off. And so what ends up happening is they're in the gym with guys. And of course, it's competitive. So you kind of have to be a little masculine in there. But then when you leave, it's still on and you're still being combative and challenging and like very still masculine, even when you're not in that space anymore. Mm -hmm. It's something that I see a lot, again, in, in a lot of the Muay Thai and MMA gyms. And I'm curious to know if you've seen that and what your thoughts are on that. I mean, we all have the, I feel, we all have the uh, kind of more masculine, how do you say that? Masculinity masculine. Yes. and feminine part. Yes. Everyone has it, Every, men and women. 100%. Depends on each one if you have one a little bit more higher than the other. Yes. Uh, yes, fighting, you have to get out that more male part of it mm -hmm. uh but i don't know like i i think it 
for me, it was the way I was raised, you know, and like how I am. And I feel like I had more of that feminine part in myself. And one thing of what I do for my life doesn't mean that's going to dictate my, you know, how I behave outside. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm curious because, well, yeah, you can see a lot of girls out there like they don't really care. They care of themselves, let's say they're just focused on like fighting and stop like caring about taking care of them, how they look mm -hmm. and all these things. But I, I'm curious if that's more like a personality kind of thing mm -hmm. or culture where they came, came from. Mm -hmm. um, because, again, my case is definitely not that way. Yeah. I don't feel, I mean, yeah, no, I, I was not raised like that. Even I always fought with my dad because when I started training, because mm -hmm. um, I trained two or three times a day, I was always in workout clothes. And that was a fight with my dad. He was like, no, you can't. You got to go and put something nice. Like, you can't be in your workout clothes the whole day. You look terrible. <laughs> like that. He said it in my face. So, okay. at the beginning, I was like, no, but that doesn't make sense. In two hours, I'm going to train. Like, no. And then years after, I understand what he was trying to tell me. Mm -hmm. Like, no. Like, you're also a human being. Go out there and be a human being. Yeah. And, and that's also going to help you balance your life. Because mm -hmm. if you put everything into just one single thing, you're going to go crazy. And I feel that's why many of us fighters, uh, after the fight, it's like, I need a time off. Because you put so much into so much. it. Yeah. Energy and your time and effort and even your thoughts are so much into it that after the fight, it's like, I need a break. I need, I need to not see a gym, a boxing love, because <laughs> I'm tired of it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I went out. But, but yeah, I feel... In my personal case and the girls that are around me, um, one thing is one thing and the other one doesn't need to change because of that. You kind of talk about switching, you know, from being in your fighter role to just being a normal human being. But when you're, when you think about yourself, right? Like if I were to ask you this question right now, who is Sabina Mazo? Oh my God. What, what answer do you give to that? Do you say what you do like what what do you say sabina who are you so emily actually uh the girl that takes the pictures at lighthouse asked me the same question because i asked it took me five friend. minutes it took me uh -huh. five minutes <laughs> i couldn't say i was a mma fighter that was not the first thing because what was I, the first thing that came to your mind i just came my, my name okay my name and where it came from okay and there, like i had a moment because Yes, it, it's part of who I am, what I do, mm -hmm. but I'm not only a MMA fighter, you know. I, I'm a learner. I, you know, um, I have a lot of different passions. I have goals, but MMA is not the only thing I do, mm -hmm. you know. And one day I'm going to stop doing MMA for sure. Mm -hmm. I know in, I don't know, in the next years, I my body won't handle it anymore. So... I try not to have that as my definition of who I am. That's why I also do a, a lot of things. You know, I like to teach. I like to study nutrition and apply it to other people. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't make me only a nutritionist. Yep. So I feel like, no, it doesn't define me. I'm more like a, uh, a learner and, and try to um, put myself in kind of dangerous situations and, and keep learning. I yeah. feel I feel that's that. But but no, I don't define my sport as who I am. Do you? No. No. I don't even like telling people that I no. like, Me neither. No. Like I used to go to parties back home in, in, in DC and people were like, oh what do you do? And I'd be like, I work in IT. Because I did, but like I work in IT. Yeah. People ask me now what I do. Oh I'm a video editor. Yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah. I don't like because as we know in society, when pe people use these labels to easily put you into like a box, yeah. right? And we all know what the stereotypical fighter looks like. And most MMA fighters are that, right? But then when you feel like you're not that quote unquote stereotypical MMA fighter, but then you have to tell someone, oh yeah, I'm an MMA fighter. Then it's like, oh, okay. Put you in that box and then you can't get out of it. Yeah. So I think what I like to do 
whenever I think about this question, I think about this question a lot. I try to talk about my characteristics, my morals, because that's who I am, right? You are your characteristics yeah. and your morals. Yeah. You are... Your personality. Your personality, yeah. right? You're not the things that you do. You're not the occupation, the hobby. You're not any of those things. Yeah. They're things that you enjoy. Exactly. But it's not you. No. And what if you stop doing them? Now who you are. Yeah. You know, that's... Yeah. And and some moment of my career um, where I was not aligned, I didn't have the right people... Mm-hmm. I thought about like stop fighting mm-hmm. at all. I, I was not enjoying it. I had to fight because I had to pay bills, and mm. I was like, "But if I stop, who am I? What am I gonna do?" Mm. Um, I enjoyed to train. I still enjoy to train. Yeah. But um, that's when like no, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a time off to fight. I'm not gonna fight. I'm gonna focus on myself, like try to rediscover who I am, what I like, mm-hmm. um, surround myself of different people. And and that's when I was like, no, this is not I wanna fight again. I have that desire again. But that doesn't define that I'm just a MMA fighter as well. I don't I don't I don't like that label too. But also people will label you even if you say like, Oh, I'm a doctor, you're already in a box. <laughs> yeah. You're in a box. Yeah. So I don't really care whatever they think, but they don't, even people don't believe I fight. Really? Like they look at me in the street and whatever, and they're like, oh, well, well, you fight? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, no, you don't fight. I'm like, yeah, okay, I don't fight, whatever. So sometimes I say better I'm an athlete, and they believe me. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but think about it. If you're walking down the street dressed like this, no one's going to think you're fighting. No. They're going to be like, oh. No, but I have a little cut. Maybe. They could be like, oh, she works at a coffee shop. Yeah. So, <laughs> this, is a, this is a Starbucks employee, right? The, this is no, not a no. fighter. <laughs> no, th- well, I, I broke my leg last year. Mm. I prepared for the fight. Yes. And then I had um, a little cast on and a boot. Uh, it was a boot. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, four different people, four different people, different days, they asked me, oh, um, so you broke uh, your your leg um, skating? Like ice skating, I was like. All of them said the same. Four thing. people ice skating. Ice skating. I'm like, like, no. Some of them, I say, yeah, sure, I did it, but it was weird. Like, also, like now they're in LA. This, why are you? Who's <laughs> well, thinking about know. ice skating in LA? Ice skating for different people. I'm like, well, this is this is new. I didn't. I don't know why. I don't know the, if the outfit I was wearing or what it, <laughs> it was. It was all on the same day. But you had no, the same. no, no. Different days. Different, different days. people. Interesting. Very, very different. Well, now you got to yeah. now you gotta become an ice skater. You mm. have to at least try. I don't know. No, I actually, I broke my leg. The first time in my life, I broke it um, ice skating when I was like eight years old. <laughs> so I'm terrified. This is like a, is like a full circle. I right know. <laughs> I'm terrified. I I hate it. I don't like it. I tried it again, but I'm like not. I'm super nervous about it. I don't like it. Nothing with skates. No. I put me like a, a football, basketball, whatever. Where your feet can touch the ground. Yes, but no, <laughs> no There's skates. a barrier, you don't want it. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't like it. Even skiing, I kind of like it, but the rest, no. As we know, for most for most professional fighters, the fighting in the UFC is like up here, right? Even you, before we started, you were asking me like where I wanted to fight and stuff like that, right? And I think sometimes a lot of fighters strive to get to these different places, but you've been there. You had seven fights in the UFC. Yeah. And I'm wondering, looking back on it, as you're as you're coming back into the UFC, what did you what would you tell yourself as twenty year old Sabina who gets signed to the UFC? What would you tell yourself in that moment that you know now that maybe you didn't know before? Well, I would advise twenty year old Sabina that um, that I couldn't put my career in other people's hands Mm. or coaches or partner or manager. I feel like I, whenever I took a decision myself with, you know, just thinking of me, I did great. So I will advise that 
you know, as a as a little as a little kid, I think I kind of let other people manage um, my life and my career where I didn't want it to. And um, and actually also like it's hard. The first fight I, I had in the UFC, I lost it. Mm-hmm. Um, I was very nervous, very nervous. Like the first two rounds, I was like kind of lost you know i the third round the third round i won the round like like nothing like i was like really um making her pay but it was too late you know yeah because i woke up too late i was nervous the two rounds i was like where where am i but you were more nervous just because you were fighting in the ufc yeah 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 so it's kind of i, I think also advice it's kind of the same thing you know as soon as they close the cage or the octagon that's it. You know, you can be fighting in the UFC. You can be fighting in Bellator, PFL, LFA, whatever. Mm-hmm. But it's a job. That's that's the moment you have to concentrate and do your best. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter who's watching, who's not watching. Um, the promotion and nothing. You have to commit to your work and do your best as soon as they close that cage. Yeah. So I would advise that for sure. A lot of a lot of fighters that fight for the debut in the UFC, they feel that that nervous, that those lights, that wow, you know, you're fighting in the UFC now. Mm-hmm. But um, I feel if you keep that focus in there, it's kind of a solution to it. Like, okay, yeah, you can feel that nervous and that excitement when you're walking out, when you're there. But whatever, your job is right there. That's it. You came all the way. To the UFC to do your best, so um, I will. I think that that's my advice. Yeah. I remember my first fight in Bellator, which was also my pro debut. Okay. I remember being in the back, like before I was warming up for anything. They gave me the gloves, and then I my hands got wrapped, and then I put the gloves on. I remember just sitting there looking at the gloves, like. I'm about to fight for fucking Bellator right now. Wow. What the fuck is happening? Yeah. And I was just like, and it, it was a whole thing because the year before, uh, Gaston Bolanos was fighting in Bellator. And I remember saying after watching him, like, I could do that. Like, I could I could get into Bellator. Yeah. And then a, almost exactly a year later, I'm sitting there looking at these gloves. Wow. Before I went to go fight. Wow. Similar thing happened when I fought for Cage Warriors also. Because I'd watched so many people fight on Cage Warriors before. And then I'm sitting there and I'm like, wow, fucking Cage Warriors gloves. But it's not, it it doesn't, you know, I don't think that I had like that, you know, when you get into a big promotion kind of thing, you have you have those feelings and maybe I'll feel something different whenever I fight in the UFC. But I don't know. It's something, there is something to that though. Like when you see yourself Definitely. with these gloves on and Definitely. it says whatever logo that you've yeah. been watching for for a long time, Definitely. it makes you feel different. Yeah. 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 And it could get you nervous or excited. But again, you got to manage your emotions and mm-hmm. just as soon as the work has to be done, do it. I've always wondered this because it just happened to me recently. I'll tell you what, it, what, what I what I felt first, and then I'm, I'm going to ask you the question. So for me, I didn't really feel like I was a fighter until my last fight. Wow. I've had 30-some fights between kickboxing, Muay Thai. And you didn't feel you were... That's so weird. I didn't. Until this last fight I had with Cage Warriors. Why is that? I don't know. But I, but I remember watching myself, and I think maybe it's because... I finally like started to show a little bit of who I was. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah. But because in all my other fights, you know, I mean, you, you've you seen me when I'm like, when I'm drilling, I'm like very like textbook, like do yeah. everything the yeah. correct way. Yeah. But then when I'm sparring, I'm a little bit more loose, loose and I'm like just doing, you know, cool stuff. Yeah. And I think in the, in the fights that I've had before, I was still in that box of like not being as creative yet, not letting myself come out through the fight. And I was still very like technical and I want to be perfect and I want to, right? And the the cool creative stuff didn't come out. But then this last fight, I was so, I was almost too comfortable. I was so comfortable. 
And I think that's why it kind of came out the way that it did. And it took me a little while. Like, you know, the the first round, I definitely th thought I lost. But as the fight went on, I started to come out of that. And I was like, yeah, like, after the fight and me watching it over again, I was like, this feels like yeah. I'm a fighter now. Wow. Because I'm more comfortable here. I'm more comfortable in the fight. And I feel like myself more. Right. Like, who I am actually showed in the fight, I guess. If that yeah, yeah, yeah. So... That's my question. Is like, do you have you ever felt like there was a define a fight that defined you where you were like, oh yeah, like I'm a I'm a fucking fighter now. Yeah. Like I'm a fighter now. People have to address me as a fucking fighter now. <laughs> have you have you had that moment? So I felt I was a fighter. Mm -hmm. My first MMA fight. Interesting. So it was the MMA fight that got MMA. you there, not the boxing or anything else. No, my first MMA fight. Where everyone, everyone thought I was going to lose. I lost against a girl that she's in Bellator right now, Alejandra Lara. She had six fights. She calling me in too? She's calling me in too. Okay. Six fights. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have any fights, MMA fights at all. and uh, But I believed I could fight, mm -hmm. you know. And that was the only option I had in Colombia. It was her or, or I had to look out. In other country. How, were there a lot of Colombian MMA fighters at that time? No, 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 not a lot. Not a lot. And still, there's not a lot of fighters, okay. especially female. Like, not a lot. So, for me, it was a challenge, you know. I I, I, I knew that it was going to be a hard fight. I knew, um, but I wanted to. So, as soon as I finished that fight, that was it. I was like... I'm a I'm a fighter, you know. This is what I like to do. I'm a fighter, and I'm gonna keep fighting. So, because uh, I want to be the best in the world. But like when, for other people to address me as an MMA fighter, I mean, I was just joking about that. Part. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> because be, no, because a lot of people like that, you yeah. know. Like oh, you know what? I'm a MMA fighter and whatever. Yeah. Um, I didn't have really that moment. And I didn't like to talk about too much what I did. For example, when I went back to Colombia and everything, I had to to spread the word and everything. But um, it makes me very uncomfortable. Yeah. Even nowadays, it's like I don't know if it's something about talking about your goal, your your the things that you achieved. And I don't know. It's kind of braggy. I don't. I don't like it. I don't Same. like it. And but yeah. sometimes you have to, so other people really know who you are. Yeah. Very true. Okay, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, how are you in fight week? How are your emotions? How is your mood? I want to know how you as a fighter in fight week. I think in the past it was horrible um, because my weight cutting was not that great. And I didn't really know what I was doing. And I was not also in the best control of my emotions. I, I, I didn't start living a stoic lifestyle until much later. But fight week, honestly, is not that bad for me. Because I kind of spend the entire training camp making sure that I'm doing everything that I need to do possible to win the fight. I know that that is out of my control. We can't control what happens in the cage. We can only do our best to make sure that we're best prepared when we go there. And I think for me, in preparation, it makes me more comfortable. And then I'm just like, you know, it's all good. Like yeah. nothing bothers me. It kind of sucks because I'm not having carbs anymore. But outside of that, like, yeah, I'm good. So you're relaxed. You're not super reactive with other people. No. Or moody no. or things like that. You're super normal. Yeah. Okay. I used, when I tell you I used to be. It used to be a it lot. It used to be really bad. Like, not that long ago. My, <sighs> my, I don't know if this was my pro debut or my last amateur fight. I can't remember which one. But I was living in San Diego and my manager, Mark, um, was helping me cut weight. The weight's not coming off. And we finally got down. We got like a pound and a half left. And he's like, all right, you're going to go in the sauna for like 10 minutes. I'm like, all right, no problem. Let's do it. 
I get into the sauna, <clears throat> or he, I think he said something like five minutes or something like that. And I was like, okay, cool. As time is going, he's not he's not saying anything. And I'm time. like, I feel like it's been past five minutes. <laughs> but he's leaning on the door. And I'm like, I knock on the door, because it's you know, it's glass. I knock on it, I'm like, how much time? He's like, you gotta stay in there a little bit longer. I was like, I can't. Like, I need to, I need to get out of here. Cause you know, you know how it is. You kind of like trash. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, nope, you gotta stay in here. You gotta stay in here until you make this wait. And I start cursing him out. I'm like, Mark, you better open this fucking door right now. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, I can't. You gotta make wait. And I don't wanna be here all night. Like, you gotta do this. Do it you gotta now. stay in here a little bit longer. Oh. And I'm like trying to open the door and he's like, I'm like holding it close and he's like go sit down I'm like dude fuck you I fucking hate. like I'm just cursing him out yeah. after like maybe 12 minutes of fighting he lets me out I go on the scale I'm I'm like on weight right yeah. but I'm still pissed I'm like well, fuck this dude I'm like I walk off whatever <laughs> and then maybe like an hour later I'm like I'm sorry <laughs> I apologize. Like, I, you know, it's one of those things in the moment you just you really can't control yeah. because your body is literally in like fight or yeah, flight. Yeah, you can't you control are, it. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I just I popped off. I cursed them out, but I apologize afterwards. Yeah. J- Justin's done the same thing where he's cursed people, Everyone. everybody around, and then he's afterwards it's he's normal. like, "My bad, I'm sorry." Yeah, <laughs> but normal. you know, it's normal, we, and we all know that it's normal, so for nobody's sure. like gets mad about it. For yeah. Sure, for sure. Interesting. Interesting. I, how were how you on during fight? Fight week is different because I don't have energy to curse people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in the, that level anymore. Like, okay. that's fine. I'm pretty calm and, like, I, I do what I have to do. Um, but it's the weeks before. Mm. Like, right now or the last week, I don't have patience for people. You get irritated. Easy. I have very, very easy. Like, if I don't like something, my face can speak for myself. And sometimes I try not to be rude, but I say it. You know, I just try not out, just, just right out. If yeah. I don't like it, I just say war normally. I would just, you know, ignore it or whatever. <laughs> no, no, no. I can't. I, I, I have to say it. And um, I haven't had a lot of problems with it, but um, I, I avoid a lot of people. You know, if I'm not liking something, I just avoid because, yeah, I get pretty moody. We obviously know about all the sacrifice that comes with training, how difficult training is, how difficult training camps are, you know, dealing with managers, dealing with promoters, dealing with, you know, your training partners. But what is something fun that uh, uh, that's a part of fighting, a part of martial arts? What is something that is fun for you? When we're not talking about the difficulty of fighting. What's something that's fun? Well, you know, I think one of the parts that are, pretty fun is like a, let's say fight camp or not mm-hmm. when you go and do a sparring session that's really fun yeah you, and we're not talking about results if you do good or not but when you worked for a whole week or weeks you've been trying to make a move mm-hmm. and in the point in sparring session you make it that's really fun yeah that's yeah. really fun or when you it doesn't work and like ah, it didn't work but you have next week to do it so i really enjoy that part of the testing part of 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 uh fight camps or whatever um and also i don't know i feel just showing up in 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 practice and being able there's some days that i wake up and being able to do what i like that's fun just training you mean just training or just you know right now i'm focused on my fight and i don't need to worry anything else just fight. Mm-hmm. I'm not working. I'm not teaching. I'm just focusing my training session. And that's a blessing. You know, I feel really happy for that to be able to um, put that energy, even if I'm tired or hungry or whatever. I go do my session and I go home and rest. That's like one of the happiest moments of the day. Like, okay, I'm done with it. I did everything I had to do. And, um, and I can just sit down and do nothing. So. Why did you decide at 15, 16 years old to start fighting? And has that reason changed? I always thought it was a very selfish reason. You thought it was a selfish reason. And I still think a little bit of it because the way it makes me feel. Okay. 
fighting like that adrenaline the to be able to perform it's addicting mm -hmm. so i still fight because of that okay of of how i can improve from fight to fight so it's a personal thing so that's why i say it's a selfish goal mm -hmm. um but at the same time lately i've been trying to look at more that how i can open the path to other fighters mm. especially colombians because um there's not a lot of women out there or men even like fighting mma and the way i'm doing it going to the ufc going out of the ufc i know i'll be back in the ufc and showing this path to this people i feel that gives me a little bit more fire so that's that little extra that nowadays i have that i didn't have but definitely it's the it's the ability to go inside a cage and fight and perform and everything is so fast that you know you just have 15 or 25 minutes to show like months of work mm -hmm. and for me that's it's worth it you know to make weight to train every single day it's just i don't know it's addicting i, I love it if i could fight more often i definitely would but it's hard to make 125 more than <laughs> two or three times a year. So, By the way, I don't think that that's selfish in a way because you're just doing something that you enjoy to do. And doing something you enjoy to do and doing something that makes you feel good, I don't personally think is selfish. I think it only becomes selfish when you, when you choose that over anything else that is happening in your life and you're hurting other people. And I don't think No, that that's not the anyone. case. Yeah, I don't think you're hurting anyone. So mm. yeah, I think that's well, yeah. good. Yeah. That's a good reason. Yeah. It's fully how how it makes me feel mm -hmm. the sport. Because there's no other other thing that makes me feel that way. Like work and other things and other sports, there's nothing like the same feeling as fighting. So. Wow. I appreciate you spending some time with me today. Um Thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. For those who don't remember, you are fighting on August, is it 4th? 4th. 4th for LFA, for that's the LFA. 130, 125 pounds. 125, 120, that's flyweight. Flyweight. Not strawweight. No, <laughs> there's no way. The flyweight title, which you will win. Yes. And then we will see you back in the UFC very soon. For sure. Thank One, you. two, or three. I don't even care how many fights I have to. Um, but I'm really focused on this fight, you know, August 4th. It's very different from other fights because I have that will again to fight, to go up there and, and fight, mm. which for a long time I didn't had. And it was really sad because I was losing that, um, you know, that passion that I have for the sport. So I'm really, really happy to just go there and, and fight. So, yeah, let's get that built. Let's get it. Yeah. Okay. Future LFA champion. champion. Excuse me. Future two-time LFA champion. Yeah. Sabina Mazo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.